So you find success at, at, at the college level after being doubted, and yeah. then you get ready and you go into the NFL and they doubt you again. Yeah. You go undrafted and you get you get signed by the Jets. Uh, take us into that process and what you went through. Did you had was your confidence shaken at all by the fact that you were undrafted? And and how did you then go forward and look at the opportunity that was presented despite being undrafted? Yeah, I, I never never doubted myself or doubted that I could play on Sundays. I think my goal, even in high school, I was never like, hey, I want to play in the NFL. As a little kid, I said, yeah. You know, I love Emmett Smith. I love the, the, the Cowboys. And I was like, man, I want to play in the NFL. But once I got to the age of high school, I, you know, it went from, you know, setting more, you know, um, obtainable goals, you know, and, and saying, hey, I just want to play at the next level. I just want to play college football. And once I started playing college football, um, I was like, I want to be an All-American, you know, and and then I was was an All-American. Then I was like, hey, you know, I want to be one of the the top in the country. And, you know, then I was up for, you know, the Buck Buchanan Award, which was one of the top defensive players in the country. So there was just ground level things that I kept doing to push myself to never get complacent. And then once I got to the NFL, it wasn't a matter of can I play on Sundays it was a matter of earning everyone's respect and proving them that I could play on Sundays. And so that's a mentality. I remember I got the, the, the call to, you know, on, on draft, it was the second day of the draft and, you know, um, Cincinnati Bengals gave me a call and they said, Hey, you know, we, we love you. We, we are looking, we have a six round pick coming up here and we, we need a safety. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about drafting you. So just be, be ready. And so the six round came, you know, they, they picked up another safety. Then the seventh round came and they called me back and said, hey, coming up in the seventh pick, we're going to pick you. We're going to draft you again. Well, they ended up drafting, you know, uh, another Nigerian safety from Notre Dame. And then they brought me out for a workout. And so that rookie mini camp in, in Cincinnati, I outplayed all their draft picks. But it would have made them look bad if they signed me and released the draft picks that they drafted. <laughs> so they ended up saying, hey, this isn't going to work out and sent me on my way. By, by the time I got back to UMass, um, Don Brown, who's, you know, uh, the defensive coordinator for Michigan, go blue. Um, <laughs> he, was my, uh, he, was my, he was my head coach at the time at UMass. And he made a call and said, hey, let me just, you know, make a call. And he called the New York Jets uh, general manager at the time, Mike Tannenbaum. And he's a UMass grad. And so he said, hey, we'll bring him out for our rookie minicamp. And, you know, you tell him to pack his bags as if he's going to stay here and he'll have to prove, you know, what he can do. And, you know, that rookie minicamp, I mean, our rookie class had David Harris, Darrell Revis, um, Chancey Stuckey, you know, who played at Clemson. I mean, there, we, we were loaded in terms of the talent, um, the talent level. And I went in there and saying, hey, Anything Revis does, I'm going to do. So if he's number one in the line, I'm going to be number two in the line. And, you know, he's going to compete hard. I'm going to compete hard. And just went with that mentality to prove um, that I could make it. And, you know, before the end of rookie minicamp, you know, general manager came over to me during practice and said, hey, I just wanted to let you know you earned a contract with the New York Jets. And so, you know, that, that, that was history after that, you know. It's pretty cool, man. And I think one of the things that – you know, I, I really love hearing you talk about is the way you, you set up your goals through the process of, of your growth, getting from, you know, youth all the way up to the pro level. Every step you took was very bite sized. You didn't set your eyes too far away from what you were doing in the current moment. And so it wasn't anxiety about, well, oh, crap, I had a bad game. Am I going to still be able to make the NFL? That's not what you were thinking about at any point. But you were like, how do I maintain my starting spot? And then how do I become a, a, the best player on the team? And then how do I become an All-American? Each step is very measurable, very current. And I think that kind of mindset is something I also see in a lot of great business leaders as well. So it's really cool to see you thinking of things in, in that way. And I think another thing I want to note is the UMass thing. I, I also... I'm familiar with Andy Isabella, who came out of UMass, yeah. plays on the Cardinals. Great yeah. guy. That's my yeah. dad. So I'm fortunate enough to be able to have hung out with him once um, and just like picked his brain for an hour and a half. And it's just you guys are coming out of UMass so humble, so down to earth, and y'all work way harder than anybody I've met. 
Is that a cultural thing up there? Is that just what happens when you're from a school that's not highly touted for being able to send guys to the pro level? Where does that come from? Yeah, it, it, it definitely does. I mean, to your, you know, your first point, you know, this is stuff that I've learned, you know, post, you know, NFL in terms of the business world is, you know, the, the acronym SMART, you know, which is, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, relevant and, and, and time bound, you know, and having that mentality ingrained into me, even from a young age with my goal setting, not really knowing that that's what I was doing, but I always made sure that I gave myself little bite size, you know, pieces that I could, you know, accomplish and then say, okay, well, you did that. Now let's go to the next piece. And so having that mentality along with the small town, small school, the, the chip on your shoulder in terms of, you know, not being highly recruited out of high school, no matter what your a- accolades were. Like the reality is, you know, unless you're, I mean, I can't even think of really guys that are out of Massachusetts high schools that are, you know, top recruits. I mean, it just re- doesn't, you mass Massachusetts in general just doesn't get a respect for producing football players. So, um, you know, so you have to have that extra edge and that's what kind of separates us when we get the opportunity is, you know, from guys like the Andy Isabella's, the Victor Cruz's, I mean, the Marcel ships, you know, that were, that he was at Arizona as well. You have that mentality is, Hey, once I get this opportunity, I'm going to show you what, you know, what I can do. And, and, and that's really where, where that comes from. Yeah. That's awesome, man. And I think, you know, you, you find your way onto the roster. This is something I've talked about with quite a few guys who have, made it just through pure hard work, determination, and focus. They find themselves in a situation where they're entering this team. They're not the most covered by the media. They're not the most touted. There's a lot of risk on them because, you know, one bad move, they're cut, right? So there's a lot of pressure there. Um, I know that the process of training camp can be almost as political and almost as uh, personality-based as it is skill-based. How the heck do you come out of college undrafted, work your way into the roster? How do you navigate that scene within the team? How do you learn the culture? And what got you into your role there on special teams? Yeah, well, to, you know, that's a great question. You know, one thing that I've always learned, and it goes back to being the youngest in my family, is I'm very I'm able to be attentive to what's successful and what isn't very quickly. So I can adapt to seeing other people's success patterns and other people's failures. And so that's something that I used the second I stepped into that locker room. I looked at the veterans that, you know, were on their last year of their their contracts that might not get re-signed. And I looked at their attitude and what they were doing. And then I looked at the other veterans, like the Jonathan Vilmas and, um, you know, the, the, the guys that, you know, the, the Lavernius Coles, the guys, the Chad Penningtons, the guys that have been in the league and were very productive. And I looked at their attitude and I started to imitate the things that they were doing, whether it was coming in at, at 5, 36 a.m., getting your body worked on, stretching, working out, and then, you know, getting ready for practice early or um, started to take on those habits and what you see is those habits produce, um, they, they, they work, you know, to, you know, and when you see a guy that's a veteran that's been in the league seven years and he's coming into the building a half an hour before, you know, practice and meeting starts, you know, wiping the stuff out of his eyes and, you know, well, his longevity in the league, just, it, it's not going to work out regardless how talented you are. Once your talent runs out, they start paying attention to all the times that you were late. And, and that you weren't a team guy. It's those guys that you see that do the things the right way all the time. When their talent level starts dimi- diminishing, they start finding different roles for them on the field to be productive. And that's just how the league works. It's very relationship based and it's very, um, you know, it's, 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 you know, relationship based and, and, and it's production based. And so one thing that I did when, when I, when I came into the league was I looked for, um, our special teams coach and he's Mike Westoff and the, you know, the general manager, Mike Tannenbaum said to me, he said, Hey, you better know where Mike uh, Westoff does his dry cleaning at. That's how close you need to be to him. Cause that's the only way, you're gonna make, you know? And, and so I, I literally, I was in his office. 
I said, you know, what positions do I need to learn? You know, you know, what do I need to do? And he, he would just go up there and teach me and just say, hey, da 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 da. He'd write it on the board one time, I, I would get it. And the second he showed me it, I would get it. And then so when I had the ability to be versatile on special teams or you could put me at multiple positions, well, then that just increased my value because now you don't need this seventh year, you know, second string linebacker that plays special teams and then plays on third down when the heady bow can play three different positions on special teams and he can play the same position on third down and it costs half the price. And so that's how I kind of, you know, learn the business side of the game very quickly and how, you know, teams are trying to budget. And, you know, they said they, the saying that, you know, they always had in the NFL is the more that you can do, the more that you can do, the better that, you know, you, the more you'll be around. And so I was, you know, I was that, you know, I was that immigrant worker with seven jobs, you know, I made it work.